Come on, let's love the Lord together right now. Oh, can't nobody do you like Jesus can do you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Well, it feels like an apostolic church in here tonight. Surely the presence of the Lord is here. Even on midweek, imagine that, Jesus coming to church in the middle of the week. Amen, amen. God bless you. You can be seated for just a moment. Need to say just a thing or two, and then we'll get right into the word of the Lord. <clears throat> I think first things first, y'all got one more night to take it easy. That's it, because tomorrow my amen corner flies out. And that means the rest of the time, you really going to have to help me preach. Because I know if I preach right now, at least I get one amen. But my amen is leaving me. And uh, hopefully not forever. Hopefully she'll come back at some point. But y'all pray for her. And that God would keep his hand on her safely as she, as she goes back to Oklahoma City for a short period of time. And uh, if God sees fit that we continue on here in the work of the Lord, then I assure you she will return and be back at my side uh, where she belongs. And uh, I say this often, but Jesus is my king, but she's my queen. And I can't make everybody happy. I can't make everybody happy, but I've learned if I can keep my king happy and my queen happy, life is a lot better off. Amen. And so I, I try not to make uh, everybody happy. I, it's impossible. I learned that a long time ago. You can't make everybody happy. But there are two that I do my utmost to keep happy. And uh, she's certainly one of them. And I love her. Appreciate her sacrifice, her willingness to come and be at my side through thick and thin. And, uh, you know, it's just life is a lot better off when you got your best friend to live it with and she's certainly my best friend I'm sorry brother Rankin <clears throat> she's got that spot covered <clears throat> but I, I can have more than one best friend so that's all right sister Rankin's my next best friend <laughs> I'm just teasing I'm teasing amen well I hope you came expecting to hear from the Lord tonight amen I hope that we'll look beyond the, the face of a 32-year-old man and beyond the voice of man today and somehow, someway, let God speak to your heart. I, I, I sat in the floor today of this sanctuary uh, pleading with God just to give me... And I feel very confident that the Lord has spoken into my heart for this service tonight. And I want us to all leave different than when we came. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of 2 Kings chapter 7. It's not even 8 o'clock yet. I know you have jobs and all kinds of things happening this week. But bear with me. Let's dig into God's word and see what he'll say to us. The book of 2 Kings chapter 7. Very familiar story, reading in verse 3. There were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. They said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we'll enter into the city, then the famine, there's a famine going on. It's in the city, and we'll die there. And if we sit here, we're going to die also. Now therefore come, let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, all we're going to do is die. The Bible says, and they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord made the host of Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and a noise of horses and even a noise of a great host. They said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us uh, the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. And they arose and fled in the twilight. They left everything there. They fled for their life. When these lepers came to the uttermost parts of the camp, they went into one tent. 
They did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment, and they went and hid it. They came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it as well. Then they said one to another, wait just a second. We do not well. This day is the day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry until the morning light, so this is nighttime. This is the twilight. If they say, if we, we tarry until tomorrow morning, some mischief will surely come upon us. Uh, therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. Sunday night, I, I pulled my title straight from the word of God. And forgive me, I'd like to do the same thing again tonight. I want to talk to you from verse 5 tonight. And they rose up in the twilight. And they rose up in the twilight. Would you lift your hands and your voices once again? God, we need you in this house. Speak to every heart, to every mind, to every soul, to every spirit. God, we thank you for your word and what you're going to do in this house tonight. Let us be responsive. Let us receive the word with gladness. God, help us that we leave different. Change us, stir us, challenge us, encourage us. Strengthen us, oh God. Help us to be what you want us to be, I pray. Put us on the wheel of the potter yet again tonight and mold us and make us. Woo, in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. And somebody say amen. God bless you today. Thank you for standing and responding to the reading of the word of God. You may be seated. Praise God. I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. And if you're going to be here, I assure you we're going to have a good time. If you just want to come and enjoy some fellowship, ask some questions. I don't have all the answers, but if I can help in any way, I'll do the best I can. I'm not an expert uh, in any way, shape, or fashion, but I certainly love what we're going to do tomorrow night. I love preaching, uh, but what we're going to talk about tomorrow night is certainly my heartbeat, and I hope we can help somebody. Amen. I love the story here that we read in our text. I've heard this passage of Scripture preached, preached numerous times, each preached in its own way, uh, highlighting certain aspects that are all worthy of preaching about. Anybody ever heard this subject preached about? Wonderful. It'll make it even better tonight if you never heard it. There's a certain quality shown in the Word of God by four men. And to be quite honest with you, these four men just did not have it all together, literally. The Bible does not name them. It doesn't give us their origin story. It doesn't tell us how they got in the place that they were how they met up, if they knew each other before they became lepers. All the Bible says is that there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. I want you to imagine with me today, if, to, if you can, to, to what it would have been like to come in and out of the city and see four sickened men with a deadly disease. No doubt people avoided and went around them as far as possible, proceeding with great caution. If I were to uh, bring in the back door today a man with leprosy, surely, me included, we would all scatter. Nobody wants to be around the leper. And so I, I don't have to go into great depth to explain the horrors of leprosy, but if you've never read about it, heard about it, it's it's a disease where your flesh basically falls apart. There's pieces and limbs and appendages and fingers and noses and, and toes and just it just eats your body up. And these men were cursed with this. They were missing parts and pieces of themselves. Uh, let me just make it clear, leprosy was ugly. It was disfiguring. Oftentimes, it, unless Jesus got involved, it was fatal. It was a cruel disease. I, 
I, I would not ever want to be one, and you would not as well ever want to be stricken with that evil thing called leprosy. I've heard it more than once that these four men looked at one another and what caused them to make some attempt to stand and wrap their arms around each other best of their ability and begin to march was simply pure determination that brought them uh, from where they were to where God took them. I've heard it was nothing more than just their attitude that caused them to leave the gate and, and move forward. And, and, and I've heard just a, a, a number of, of, of different ways that this has been uh, presented. And surely all of those and more can be correct. Nothing wrong with any of it. But I, I, I would, would venture to say that uh, what, what, what I felt like God put in my heart in regards to this passage of Scripture and for this particular church and this service tonight is that these four leprous men possess something beyond determination, beyond attitude, beyond uh, just a mental uh, a decision to get up and go. They, they possess something that I, I just feel if we could take from this story anything, this would benefit this church the most. Uh, this one thing that these four men possessed, it was uh, exactly the very same thing it's going to take for the apostolic church, more specifically the Jesus church, to rise up from where we are and move to where God wants us to go. Now, I, I've come to be extremely real with everybody in the building today. I, I, I hope you understand my heartbeat. I'm not here to, to be any kind of, of any way or, or hope you don't misunderstand what I've come to preach. But I've come to try to deal with something in the Holy Ghost. Uh, and, and let me just tell you today, it's not the will of God uh, for this church to remain in the same place forever. I'm talking further beyond a physical location on Main Street. I'm talking about the same place in the spirit realm. It's not the will of God for this church to hunker down, to hold up, and to wait for Jesus to come back and sit here on our hands and, and just hope and pray it all works out. No, it is not the will of God that we sit here on apostolic pews and have a we might as well sit here until we die mentality. I've punched my ticket. I've got the Holy Ghost. I'm good to go until Jesus comes back. I, I present to you today that there is something beyond where you are today. There's a place of victory. There is a place of provision. There's a place of fulfillment. And the question that the Holy Ghost has sent me to ask you today is how bad do you want it? Think with me today. Four leprous men sitting at the gate on the outskirts of a city. A great famine has swept through the land. Four lepers bodies weakened, barely hanging on by a thread. No doubt their physical and mental conditions have been pushed to the limit. As they sit there, a cloud of death looming over them and all around them. Certainly a situation filled with hopelessness. A, a story that does not seem to have a, a happy ending. And all of a sudden, the one thing that began to grip them, that needs to grip every soul under the sound of my voice today was a pain that began to gnaw in the pit of their stomach. It was something that began to growl and, and it was to the point that the man sitting next to each other could hear the others growl. He could hear the, other, the others ache, the others yearning. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? You go on a three-day fast, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you start feeling the same exact pain in the pit of your stomach. You, you, you go a, a few hours, a day or so, it don't even have to be three days for some of us, and, and all of a sudden it begins to get a hold of us. Uh, it, it was more than an awakening in their spirit. It was more than determination and mental fortitude. It was a, it was a, a hunger that got a hold of them. It was, it was a realization that, hey, there's a famine going on 
on and we're missing something. Uh, We're missing substance on the inside uh, of our beings. And so this is what the Holy Ghost has brought to my attention. Uh, I came to preach to this wonderful congregation uh, about the very key ingredient uh, that would cause this church to be shaken uh, and go beyond the walls and shake this city. Uh, And I present that it would even shake uh, the very core of this world uh, if every soul in the apostolic church uh, got a hold of a a hunger for the things of God uh, and somewhere we get up from where we are uh, and say we will rise. Uh, We will not sit here until we die. Somewhere there's got to be a conquering of the mentality of it's just us four and no more. I'm saved and sanctified and on my way to heaven and that's good enough for me. No sir, no ma'am, not when there's a famine in the land. I wish today I could tell you that we're going to have 100% success rate before we leave the building. I wish I could guarantee us today, Pastor and Bishop, that that by the time the message is over and the response to the Word of God is done, that everybody in the building is going to leave being on board. But sadly, it's just not the case. It's just, I wish it would be. I hope it would. I pray it would. But I, I just don't know that it's going to. So I tell you, if I could somehow settle for just four precious saints of God that could connect with me in the Holy Ghost uh, and decide I choose uh, to get hungrier than I've ever been before uh, and I'm going to take some steps uh, I'm going to move in a direction uh, that I've never moved before I I wish everybody would uh, but I'll settle for just four uh, that'll connect with me in the Holy Ghost the Bible says and uh, They rose up in the twilight. Uh, Understand that's more than just a time of day. As far as life was concerned, that's exactly where these four lepers were. The twilight moments of their life. Uh, As far as they were concerned, uh, it was almost over for them. One foot in the grave, uh, if you will. I never find in the Bible where they were healed uh, or where they were miraculously made whole. Uh, I can only assume that leprosy finished uh, what it originally started. Uh, But hear me today, none of that really matters. All that matters uh, is that this thing called hunger uh, calls them to rise up in the twilight moments uh, just before it was almost over. Uh, Hunger calls them to get up from where they were uh, and say we've got just a little time Time left, but as long as the clock's still ticking, then we got something we gotta do. And so hunger took them from where they were to a place of fulfillment. It caused them to do something about their present situation. Hunger overcame their fear of failure. And I could preach to some folks today that the only reason you don't do more for God and the kingdom of God is you're scared. You have a fear of failing. What you don't understand is that his grace is sufficient for you. And so get up. Because in your weakness his strength is made perfect. God's not giving you the spirit of fear. But he's giving you a... Are you hearing me today? God will take care of your insufficiency. If you'll just say this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get busy for God. What a complete paradigm shift. As we look and see this portrayal of four men waiting to die. Sitting by a gate. Almost over. And they make a decision. Here we are. The year 2023. We know not the hour nor the day. That Jesus is going to return. All we know is it's going to be any time. As far as I can tell. And Bishop you back me up. You vouch for me because you've been preaching this a long time. But they used to tell you when you was a little boy and a young man, Jesus is coming back any day. And here we are 50, 60 years later and he's not come back yet. But that does not change the fact that he's still coming back any day. We are in the twilight hours like never before. We're closer to the coming of the Lord than we've ever been. 
I just have to believe it's not going to be too much longer now that Jesus is coming back and this world is going to wrap up and whatever we got left, whatever time remains, I want God to find the church somewhere in Victoria, Texas that he can look at and say those people want more than what they have. I want God to look over the banisters of heaven and say, wait just a second, Gabriel. Don't blow the trumpet yet. Come here, angels. Come here, saints of old. There's a church that's making up their mind on a midweek service that in the twilight hours, we're going to rise up. I feel this so strongly in my spirit uh, that if this church doesn't get a hold uh, of what I've come to preach tonight by the help of God, uh, if we don't get a raw, real, old-fashioned hunger for the things of God uh, and His Spirit uh, and His presence uh, and His kingdom to come uh, and His will to be done, uh, I just don't know that God uh, is going to look at us anymore. Uh, If we don't make up our minds, uh, we're not staying where we are, but we're We're moving uh, and we're marching uh, and we're going beyond. At what point do we make up our minds that his purpose supersedes, overrides our purpose? Even more, what point does it become? His purpose doesn't just override, but his purpose becomes my purpose. You hear me today, we can have so much more than what we have here. 65,000 people. You think God's happy with just a little slice of the pie around here? He's a God that says, I'm not just going to fill your cup, I'm going to let it overflow. The concept in God's mind is a mindset of overflow. He's not a God that's about barely. He's a God that says, I want you to have it and have it more abundantly. That's the God I serve. And so God looks at us and wow, while some, not everybody, I I know it's not everybody today, but there are some that you're content with what's here and you're okay with how things are. But I'm going to tell you, I still see empty spaces in the pews. And I'm going to tell you something else. God still sees the empty spaces. This is no time for patty cake with Jesus. We need a move of the Holy Ghost. We need a moving of the Spirit of God. We need an old-fashioned demonstration of the power of God. I'm going to bring it real to you today. I've been in enough churches now. I'm sick and tired of coffee shop church. I'm sick and tired of casual dining churches. Come as you are and leave the same way church. I'm so sick of churches with the name apostolic and Pentecost being considered as complacent. We just go through the motions doing what we've always done because it's what we always do. Somewhere we've got to get beyond complacent filled sanctuaries and get back to Holy Ghost. Glory coming down. Blue presence of God coming in. Don't get us out of order, preacher. Don't buck the program, preacher. Pastor Rankin, don't mess up our routine. Don't mess up the protocol. I'm going to tell you whatever happened to church where there were signs and wonders and miracles and deliverances. Jesus had church and they would tear the roof off just to get to where he was. God forbid somebody come in here and mess everything up. No, honey, I want it messed up. I want a move of God. I know it's midweek and I'm supposed to lay low this evening, but oh, I've come with a mandate from God today. This church has been put here however many years ago for a purpose that there would be hurting lost souls walking off the street and in one service their life would be transformed. But transformation doesn't happen in an environment filled with complacency. Transformation happens when there are people hungry for more than what you have. 
And if you're hungry for more, you'll be willing to do whatever you got to do to get from where you are to where God wants you to go. With the blessings of God that we stopped hungering for more. I'm, I'm 32. I'm preaching probably 60, 50, 60 years too late tonight. This kind of preaching used to go a long way. I've heard the stories, the tapes, the cassettes, the records, whatever. I've heard my grandmother tell me stories. My grandfather, my bishop, who's gone on to meet the Lord. Stories. And yet here we are today enjoying the blessings of God. That we're so content with what we have that we have no longer hungered for anything more because we're okay. And we forget our sole purpose is souls. It's not just about what happens inside the house. It's about what happens outside the house. Oh, that God would propel us off of this Pentecostal plateau of religiosity. That we're just coming in here and we're just like every other church. But oh, somewhere I'm believing somebody is going to get it in their heart. I'm apostolic to the core. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet. I'm going to be who God called me to be. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. I refuse to be sitting here with the mentality that says I'll die. I want to be counted as one that rises up in the hours of the twilight. You want to you know what God has desired for this church? He wants to blow the doors off this place. Phase one is nothing for God. Phase two is nothing for, I don't know how many phases you got. God will take you to a hundred phases if necessary. He'll provide the building, the land, the permits, the money. You just get hungry for more of God and God will fill you up until, oh, I'm in the Holy Ghost right now. God's got to know that this church is willing to go the distance. God's got to know that we'll do whatever it takes, Pastor. We're behind you. Bishop, we're behind you. We want more of God. Churches back in the day. I'm not one to live in the past and say, oh, I wish it was like the good old days. I'm thankful for today. I promise you I am. But it was out in cow pastures. Brother Rankin, me and you, we just 30 in our 30s. But back in the day, they had church. It wasn't even electricity. It was out in cow pastures and barns and tents and sawdust floors and no AC and no sound system and just the, just the light of the moon and some stars and maybe a torch or two. And, and oh, they would have raw, unfettered, conviction-packed uh, moves of the Holy Ghost. Uh, they came early. Uh, they left late. Uh, they lingered at the altar call uh, because they just didn't want to miss out uh, on what God was going to do. We got young people and we got children. They don't even know the definition of lingering. Some of you old timers, some of you precious elders, you mothers of Israel, you elders, you remember what it's like, don't you? I wasn't there, but surely you remember when you just laid in the floor and the power of God would move and you didn't want to leave because the Holy Ghost was there. Woo. I remember as a little boy, just five and six years old, running up and down the aisles. Bobby pins everywhere, high heels scattered, uh, men and women slain in the spirit. Uh, nobody could care less what time Burger King closed. Uh, we didn't want to leave where God was. Uh, we didn't want to get up from where God was moving. Uh, and there's another generation coming behind us. 
And they're going to miss out on what used to be. Because mamas and daddies uh, and adults that ought to know better uh, have lost their hunger for more of God. We rush the prayer. We rush the music. We rush the preacher. We sing our two little, three little songs. Check our watches after about 30 minutes. uh, And then we come around and have a little shallow altar call. And it's nothing to fellowship for three hours afterwards. Don't tell me you don't have enough to talk about. Uh, You just don't have enough relationship with the one that you need to be talking to. We even get frustrated at times because God... Just don't do it like we think he should. But I'm here to tell you God's not waiting. Uh, God is not going to be found as one that we're waiting on him. God's waiting on you. And God wants this church to know God will feed uh, those that are hungry. Uh, But God's not going to force feed you. Uh, You have to be hungry for what he wants to do uh, with you uh, and this church. Uh, It's more than just you. Uh, It's more than just me. Uh, It's about God moving. I gotta hurry today. I gotta tell you something about hunger. These four lepers exampled it so well, and we could learn something from them today because hunger is more powerful than you realize. When God revealed this to me, I'm sure hundreds of preachers have preached it's nothing new, but it hit me like a, a ton of bricks. Hunger blinded these four men from seeing each other's deficiencies. Nobody sat there in that day in that group of four lepers and made excuses. Well, we could go to the enemy's camp, but you're missing a foot. Well, we should probably get, no, 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 you're missing a hand. That's not what happened that day. Hunger said, hey, I know you're missing this. And I'm missing that. But I'll be your hands. And you be my feet. I'll be your eyes. You be my ears. It was a prime example of what the body of Christ ought to be. The reason we're looking at each other's deficiencies and pointing out everybody's flaws is because we're not hungry enough. It's easy to focus on what we don't have and set, let a hunger get a hold of you and say, this is what we do have. Too many times we look across the aisle and say, we can't have revival because they're too old or they're too young. They did this, they've done that. We don't have the talent, the program. The, we're just missing pieces. I'm going to tell you something about leprosy. Leprosy scars. Leprosy leaves some people without. And when they come through the door, not everybody's going to look the same. Not everybody's going to look, act the same. Not everybody's going to have the same talents and the same abilities. But if our level of hunger should be where God wants it to be, then the hunger will blind you from the deficiencies and the differences and the flaws. God will say, I'll get you to a place where you you look through eyes of love. That's what hunger does. It brings love back into the body. And you say, I don't see what you're missing. I just see what you have. And if you put what you have with what I brought to the table, God can do something. And so four hungry lepers missing pieces of themselves refused to make excuses. They begin to march together. We can go to the enemy's camp. Let's see where the hunger will take us. Let's see what God will do for us. But it did not start until hunger came into the picture. And so four hungry lepers overlooking each other's deficiencies, flaws, and missing pieces. You want to know what happens when you stop looking at what your brothers and sisters don't have, unity starts happening. These four men were in such condition they could not make it by themselves. They needed the man next to them. The only reason they got from where they were to where they ended up is they did it together. When you come to church and you don't see only the negative in people, It's a lot easier to agree with somebody that you don't see anything bad about. How can two walk unless they agree? If all you can do is come to church and find the negative around here, you're not hungry enough. Somebody comes up to you and says, I can't believe Pastor preached 
for 50 minutes. I can't believe we only sang two songs and we normally sing five. If all you can do is find out all the wrong, you need to look at them and say, you're not hungry enough. That's my church. That's my pastor. That's my worship team. Don't come to me about all the negative deficiencies. Come to me and tell me how hungry you are and help me march because I don't want to sit here till I die. Hunger eliminates all the excuses. Why not? And starts letting you see how you can. Starts letting you see what's right with the church. I've talked about this before. Hunger brings unity. It's why the devil fights unity in the church so much. He knows what happens when just two or three are gathering together. Because God shows up in unity. Some people ask, why don't we have 3,000 souls added to the church like they did in Pentecost? It's because we missed out on a key ingredient for the recipe of Pentecost. They prayed in one mind and in one accord. We got too many folks trying to talk to a God that they've never seen and they can't even talk to the brother and sister whom they have seen. Because all you see is what they're missing. But you got to get hungry. Because when you're hungry, you look beyond all of that and you walk in unity. Devil hates a unified church. As long as there's unity, there's going to be a devil who hates you, tries to mess it all up. But as long as there's unity, there will be a God that dwells in your midst and moves in a way that is unprecedented and unparalleled. I'm hurrying. Can you give me a few more minutes? I believe with all my heart that it was hunger that attracted God to these lepers in our story. Four men barely able to walk, no doubt, somehow, some way. Their desperate attempt to satisfy their hunger. God looks over the banisters of heaven. You know the story. And the staggered, struggling, stumbling footsteps of four hungry lepers were magnified in such a way that caused the Syrian army to turn and run away. God took what started with hunger and caused havoc. And created havoc. I wonder what would happen. Of the names written on the walls. If people got so hungry. That God can magnify your steps. And havoc would be created in their homes. To the point. They can't deal with it any longer. They run to where they only know to run to. That's the church. What kind of disruption could take place in the spirit realm? In the gates of hell if this church really started to get hungry? What could God magnify in our lives if we started marching with hungry hearts? I'm going to tell you, God was already greater than a Syrian army. But hunger caused God to take four lepers and make them greater than a Syrian army. And God wants to take this church and magnify your steps in such a way that hell cannot stand where it stands. And it's got to break down and run away. I want to tell you where revival's going to begin. It's going to begin with hunger. You want to know where victory's going to take place? It's going to be in an atmosphere of hunger. You know what's going to cause the backslider to come home? is hungry mamas and daddies that say we've got to get beyond where we are. Hunger moves you from complacency. Causes you to rise up in the twilight hours. I'm going to take it one step further. I promise I'm hurrying. I got to say it the way God gave it to me. Hungry people. Hungry people don't have a problem being faithful to the house of God. I'm not against people that have a valid excuse and Please, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There are, there are valid reasons and vacations. And there's things. I'm not against any of that. But, but when you miss church just because you're tired or you don't feel good, you got a little headache or somebody came into town, you know what? Bring them to church. Be good for them to come and feel the presence of God. <laughs> Hungry people show up every time the doors are open. Hungry people don't have to be told to worship. Hungry people don't have to be prodded to respond to the preaching of God's word. Hungry people certainly don't have to be begged to come to an altar call. They don't have to be challenged to have revival. 
Hungry people are involved in personal outreach and evangelism and Bible studies. Hungry people don't have to be asked to push the plate back and fast. Hungry people don't have to be begged to pray. They're not hungry enough if all you do is pray in pre-service prayer. And even then, some people don't even pray. You sit there and look around and listen to what everybody else is saying and give God some little mumble jumble. I'm telling you, God's not pleased with it. You've missed the point of pre-service prayer. It's not so you can come early and get your favorite seat. It's so that you can come and set an atmosphere that's conducive for the presence of God to move. Anybody cook in the building? You know, I got any cooks tonight? It's a lot easier to cook when the oven's preheated, isn't it? Everybody's happier when you don't have to tell them, sorry, I forgot to start the oven. We got to wait another 30 minutes. We don't come here and sit there until church starts and then turn it on. We get here early to heat this thing up. So that by the time that the preacher gets to where he's got to get, that the backslider can come back and be delivered and the, the, the soul can come off the street and be delivered. You understand why you got to be here? Every service and every servant counts and you got to do your part because it's not about you. It's about somebody else. The only time you open your Bibles whenever the preacher says turn to the book or whatever, I'm not hungry enough. I'm just telling you what it's going to take to cause you to rise up in the twilight. Hunger doesn't let you be complacent, meet the status quo, and do the bare minimum. It's not going to allow you to just go through the motions. It's going to elevate you. It's going to cause you to press. It's going to cause you to overcome flesh and carnality. God says, I'll take you to places in the spirit realm where you can intercede and break down walls and destroy strongholds, but you got to get hungry for it. Imagine church around here, strongholds were already. And on Tuesday, Wednesday, they didn't wait for Sunday and midweek just to come in and say, well, I'm hungry. I guess I better get me something to last me for the no, 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 no. I'm so hungry that I can't wait till church. I've got to do my part now so that when I get to church. How bad do you really want to move a God? How hungry are you willing to get? Because hunger causes you to be radical. Causes you to do things that not everybody else is going to do. These four fellas said, what are they going to do? Kill us? We're dead either way. Might as well go out in style. Jesus is coming back either way. You might as well go out in style. I'm going to say this. There was times that I ate. My wife would have dinner ready when we pastored in Henrietta, Oklahoma. She said, dinner will be ready at 6. I'd leave the office by about 5.30. I only live about 5, 6 minutes away up a hill. But there were some days I was so hungry, I couldn't wait till 6. So I'd stop at McDonald's. I'm sorry. And I, I discovered I could get 10-piece nugget, medium fry, and a large sweet tea. I can get it down before I get to the top of the hill. <laughs> and then I could walk in and smell the pork chops cooking. Fresh mashed potatoes. She'd have something baking in the oven, a cake or something. And I'd sit there and she'd start scooping it on my plate. And I'd start picking at it. And it was a thousand times better than McDonald's. I just couldn't eat it because I was already full of something else. I'm going to ask you today, if you're not hungry for the things of God and the will of God and the ways of God, what are you eating before you get here? What kind of junk are you filling up on in your spirit that when God brings it to the table, you're picking through it and say, I just don't know because you're already filled with something else. 
What you've been eating on that you ain't got no room for anything else God has to offer. Can I just help somebody today and tell you, if you're filling up on the junk of this world, uh, things that appease your flesh, uh, taste sweet to your spiritual palate, uh, then you're ruining your spiritual health. You need to go on a diet from the junk of this world and start eating off of what God's serving. My Bible says taste and see that the Lord is good. If you're not hungering for the right stuff, you need to get hungry again. So God's come to this service tonight just to see, are you satisfied with what he's done so far? Are you willing to go further? Do you want more? Do you want to go deeper in God? The answer is found in how hungry you're willing to get. Listen to this, hunger's the key to victory in your city. Time does not permit, I've run out of time, but you know the rest of the story. These men, having found a place of satisfaction and fulfillment, said to each other, we're not doing any good if we don't go tell the city what we found. So they gather themselves and they tell the people of the city where they found bread. And at the end of a story, an entire city overcome with famine is saved because of four men's hunger. Four hungry people changed the outcome of a city doomed for death. How many people in the area are starving, living in spiritual famine, doomed for an eternity without God, and they're just waiting on four hungry people to start marching from where you are and do something. There's a famine in the city of Victoria, Texas. People are dying everywhere. And yet the answer is in the walls of a Jesus church on Main Street. But somebody's got to get hungry. The music's coming. I believe God is going to magnify the steps of those that are hungry enough. I believe there's going to be babies born. But before there's ever labor pains... There's got to be hunger pains. I believe babies will be born, prodigals will return home, but first, there's got to be hunger. I believe revival in the church, the community, the city, your homes, your jobs, your schools, but first, hunger. If you have Psalms 107, I didn't give this to you. Psalms 107 and verse 33. I want this church to see this. I'm not making this up. I believe this is purpose. This is reason. It's found in the Word of God right here for the Jesus Church. It first gives what God's capable of doing. He turneth rivers into the wilderness. Verse 33 of 107. And the water springs into a dry ground. God can do this. No problem. He can take a fruitful land and make it into barrenness for the wickedness of them that dwell therein. But then God, He can turn the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. It's what God can do. He can, he can take it any way He wants to go. Because He's God. But then it says in verse 36, And there he maketh the hungry to dwell in a place where he can do anything. He said, I'm going to put hungry people right where I can do it. That they may prepare a city for habitation. And hungry people are going to sow the fields and plant vineyards which may yield fruits of increase. The Bible says he blesseth them also so that they are multiplied. Not just a little bit. They're multiplied greatly. God said if there's going to be a city hungry, people have to be willing to sow seed and plant vineyards. He's put you here to prepare a city for habitation. He's put hungry people here for a reason. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Would you stand with me all across the building? Forgive me for going longer than usual but is there anybody today that wants to get hungry for the things of God? Maybe you haven't been feeling the hunger pains for the things of the kingdom like you know you need to. Come on. The telltale sign of how bad you want it is going to be found in your level of hunger. 
how far you're willing to go, how much you want of God. Will you be counted as part of the group that rises up in the twilight hours, the closing moments of this world? I wish some prayer warriors would get hungry again. You may never preach in a pulpit, teach a Sunday school class, but everybody can be an intercessor. Is there any sisters that can be hungry again? Come on, everybody can be a soul winner. Let soul winners get hungry again. More of God, more of His Spirit, more of Him. I'm hungry, God. I'm hungry, God. Come on. Hungry people aren't quiet praying right now. Hungry people are lifting their voice. There's tears flowing. There's something on the inside of them that says, I can't stay here anymore. I can't do what I've always done. Come on, ma'am. Come on, sir. Come on, daddy. Come on, husband. Lead your family out of famine and go to a place in provision in God. Come on, this requires more than just another altar call. Real hunger pushes you beyond just another shallow prayer at the end of a message. Come on, I know it's midweek, but we got just a little bit of time to show God how hungry we really are. It's still early enough for somebody to reach beyond and press through. Make your way beyond the outskirts of the gates of the city and Go to a place in God that you know is going to take care and save others. Come on, young preacher. Come on, young preacher. You really want to be used of God? Start getting hungry like you've never been hungry before. I'll pray longer. I'll fast more. I'll study more. I'll reach for souls more. Come on, somebody push beyond that complacency. Somebody push beyond protocol and routine and get out of the norm a little bit. Show God you mean business. There's a famine. There's sons and daughters. There's people that are depending on you to get hungry. You know where to find bread. You got to do something to save the city. The Bible said he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry he fills with goodness. If you really want more of God, he'll give you peace. He'll fill you with the Spirit. I want more, Jesus. I want more, Jesus. I'm not satisfied with where we are.
Magnify the steps of my brother. Magnify the steps of my sister. Woo! Something's got to break. Something's got to break in the atmosphere. Something's got to break in generational curses. Something's got to break on the streets of Victoria. Oh, God, it's going to break out. Woo! Break it on my sister's child. Break it on my brother's Something job. Has to break. Something has Something to break. Get me to it. I believe you'll Come on, that's it. This is where we get to. I Go further. Push through this right now. right now. Somebody press through Something this right now. Come on, there it is. There it Something is. There it is. Has to break. Right now in your name. There it is. Something has to Some break. of you young ladies ought to grab the hand of an elder. Some of y'all, let generational anointing flow down. Some of you young men ought to find an elder. Come on. It's about everybody in the body working together. Something has to break. Right now in your name. In the name of Jesus. Jesus, break it, break it, break it. I believe you'll get me to it. Woo! I believe you'll lead me through it. I believe Come on. That you will do We've got it the answer right to the famine. Something break through. Break. break through in this city. Break through it. in this community. I believe you'll lead me through it. I believe that you will. Break it, God. Break it, God. Please. 
believe you'll get me to it. I believe he'll lead you through it. I believe that he will do it right now. Something has to break. I believe he'll get you to it. I believe he'll lead you through it. I believe that he will do it right now. 